Uh, yeah. Uh, so this talk is about Cargo Deny, which is a tool that uh, we have made to help us manage our dependencies. Um, so we're going to talk a little about the situation um, and kind of why we made this tool and what the idea of it is, and then go through kind of what it currently offers and possible uh, features for it. Uh, a little bit about me, I've uh, been in game development for about 13 years, um, been at uh, smaller companies, larger companies, and now very small companies. Uh, and right now I'm at Embark, uh, we're a game development studio, uh, and we're writing an engine and platform in Rust, as well as other stuff not in Rust. Um, so yeah, so here's the situation about why we created the tool. Um, and it is totally our fault. Um, so kind of give a context of where most of us are coming from. Uh, uh, we're, we've been in game dev for uh, quite a while, and generally uh, game development is in large monorepository style uh, code bases. Um, and there's basically very, very few uh, external dependencies, and all the external dependencies that you do have are vendored uh, typically into the code base where they rot. Um, uh, and ba basically, uh, as a kind of consequence of vendoring, there's extremely little interaction uh, with game development in general and open source software. So even though some software is used, like uh, a typical example would be Zlib or other compression libraries, um, like they get pulled down, they get vendored, and basically that's it. There's no more interaction, there's no bug reports, there's no uh, PRs, there's no kind of, uh, hey, could you add this feature um, that is important to us? Usually it's added internally, never shared with anyone else. Um, and, and this is kind of like, this would be what I would call classical game dev. Uh, not everyone operates this way, but this is kind of the modus operandi. Um, and so if you turn to uh, the Rust ecosystem, the Rust ecosystem is basically complete and utter opposite of this, right? Uh, pretty much everything is uh, shared and public, and if it's not public at the beginning, it eventually becomes public, um, or at least people can talk openly about what they're working on, even if it's not actual um, public code. Uh, and obviously, everyone knows like it's uh, quite large. I think the screenshot was taken two days ago or something. Um, and yeah, there's like a huge, but but uh, being a huge uh, uh, package, well, not compared to npm, but a, a large uh, package repository uh, with a lot of crates. There's a huge number of axes. Uh, that have different levels of quality and commitment from maintainers, and uh, yeah, there's a, just a huge uh, amount of um, uh, options available across the ecosystem. Um, so going back to game development, like uh, when we started the company, like obviously uh, most game development is done in C++, so going to Rust was uh, a big, kind of thing that we wanted to do. Um, and obviously, the one of the motivating factors for this was using this amazing crate ecosystem. Um, so we use uh, quite a lot of external dependencies on our uh, main primary project, um, right now about 400 plus. Um, and we tend to keep all of them up to date. We kind of tend to live at head. Uh, we uh, update. Uh, some sometimes several times a day, sometimes, uh, but typically on a weekly cadence. Um, and we actually have never vendored uh, any dependencies. We always fork, uh, use a patch to the Git repository until our PR is merged, um, and then return back to the original project. Um, and so we're kind of working quite differently from how we used to work. Um, so yeah, so the problem that comes with this, the created ecosystem is moving quite quickly. Uh, we're updating quite frequently, and you can't just look at the cargo log file uh, or cargo tree or license hound or you know all of the kind of the stuff all the time is just extremely tedious. Um, and while cargo gives some tools, it doesn't actually. Uh, 
give you a complete picture uh, of, of the crates because it doesn't really have that capability because people have different use cases and different uh, requirements and it's kind of up to you. And basically uh, we have this cadence now of updating quite frequently and the, the Rust ecosystem is obviously uh, moving quite fast and moving faster in terms of new crates and some crates get updated you know, multiple times a day. Uh, and we basically want to keep this cadence for now. Maybe we'll change it in the future, but for now we want to be updating quickly and fastly, getting new features, fixing bugs, all that kind of stuff. Uh, so that's where Cargo Deny comes in. Um, so, so basically our kind of high concept of the, the tool is that it's a, a linter for your crate graph. So, so the idea is to kind of treat your crate graph as uh, code uh, and basically do what Clippy does, which is look for things that uh, you've configured for and warn you or error and basically make sure that as your crate graph changes, uh, your expectations are met uh, every time. And so what we're checking for currently are licenses, uh, bans, or you know, basically saying I don't want particular crate or crates in my dependency graph, uh, uh, duplicate, duplicate versions of crates, uh, security advisories, and sources of your crates. Licenses, so uh, yeah, we just had a little bit of information uh, from uh, about licenses, uh, so it's so kind of, uh, again, going over this, um, crates usually specify their, their license terms in the cargo metadata. Uh, and this is kind of a pretty, pretty typical one, MIT or Apache 2. Um, and then they also have the ability to uh, give a relative path to a license file. Uh, but you have to manually inspect that because cargo doesn't care about it. Um, and so basically the question we want to ask is, are the, all the crates that we're using, using licenses that we find acceptable, um, and then making sure that that holds true over time. So if we add new crates, it has licenses that we find acceptable, and then uh, it's also possible for crates to change licenses uh, when they make a version change, sometimes even in patch versions. And so, ba so basically this is a short snippet of a configuration that you could have. Uh, so basically say uh, you can configure what happens with unlicensed crates, um, uh, crates that have copy left, uh, and then a set of licenses that you explicitly allow, as well as kind of exceptions for uh, cases where you maybe don't want to blanket allow a particular license across all the crates uh, possible, but on a particular crate. And then you can have other things like FSF-free or OSI approved as well. Uh, basically what it does is uh, evaluates the SP SPDX expression uh, that's gathered from the crate. Um, and so in this case, because we ex explicitly allowed both MIT and Apache 2, it evaluates it true because both sides of the expression are true. Um, and this works for... Um, basically all SPDEX expressions, including ones that actually aren't representable in Cargo because they're um, parsing in Cargo for the, the license field is actually not correct. Um, and so as we saw earlier, uh, there are some uh, caveats to this. Um, right now there's only kind of two sources of in input. Uh, which is the license field itself, as well as any license files that are in the crate root. And so we basically scan the license files uh, to determine the uh, license that it's in the file. And then we basically combine them all together with an AND expression uh, to be maximally um, uh, covered. Uh, but uh, in practice, um, that's not really accurate because uh, especially for C dependencies, uh, people tend to include C code into the Rust crate, link it in with everything else, and then kind of completely ignore that the C dependency has a completely different license than the rest of the crate. And um, yeah, so uh, we have a, another tool called Cargo About, which is uh, about 
kind of doing a similar thing to the the uh, notice uh, thing that we heard about earlier. But the basic idea is that it takes it does do full source code scanning of everything and then uh, finds all licenses and makes sure they comply with uh, what the crate says. And then otherwise, it'll uh, force you to specify the licenses that you found and what the expression is for the, the crate as a whole. Uh, but yeah, Cargo and I's job is to do that very, very quickly. So this takes uh, you know a millisecond or so. Um, so yeah, there are crates that we don't want. Um, and this is totally fine. Uh, not all crates uh, match the requirements that you have for your project. And there's a lot of crates uh, that have different uh, philosophies about how they update or what features they provide uh, versus other crates that kind of operate in the same niche. Um, and so sometimes we find them and we're, we say, yeah, we don't want this and we want to keep it out for all time. Uh, so a particular example uh, that was kind of the motivating reason for creating this tool in the first place was uh, OpenSSL. Uh, we despise OpenSSL. Um, and unfortunately, basically, anytime you do TLS, in the Rust ecosystem, it's almost always the case that uh, OpenSSL is the default implementation for that, even if they provide a feature to use, uh, for example, RustSSL or something. Um, and kind of the reason uh, that we find this annoying is it does have system dependencies. So if you have different systems, they have different versions of OpenSSL. And then particularly for Windows, we have some Windows users who aren't necessarily programmers, and it's another dependency that they have to install and keep up to date, and it's just tedious. Uh, so we have, yeah, this is a very simple example. Uh, the reason is doing the name is you can also have specify particular versions that you deny instead of uh, just the all versions of the crate. Uh, and we do like a quick change here. So that's request, and we just turn off uh, on default features by deleting the default features faults. And by default, request uses uh, OpenSL, and we see uh, that there's an error now. And then basically, every time uh, Cargo Deny finds anything that anything wrong, uh, and it prints a warning or error that pertains to a particular crate, it uh, optionally will produce the uh, inverse dependency graph, uh, basically how the crate gets pulled into your, to your crate graph. Uh, so the next check would be duplicates, um, which is a kind of interesting case in Rust. Um, so if you're not aware, uh, dependency resolution is hard, uh, and it's actually an MP hard problem. Uh, and so, uh, some package managers uh, will say you can only have one version of a particular dependency in the in your uh, project, and if you have conflicting versions, you have to figure out how to manually go down to one version. Uh, Cargo, uh, however, does not. It introduces a trade-off. So uh, here's a really simple case. So we have a yours crate. Uh, that depends on uh, both theirs, some other crate, as well as log. And then the theirs crate also depends on log. But fortunately, they both resolve to the same version. And so everything's fine, right? You just have one version of log, and everything is great. Uh, the much more common case in, in the Rust ecosystem is that you depend on uh, one version of log. You have a, another dependency that has a different version of log. And so in this case, like in the classical dependency resolution, this is unsatisfiable, and like you have to choose one or the other, and you have to somehow get them to both work. Um, but Cargo just says, why not both? Uh, and this is great. Uh, by saying we can have multiple versions of the same dependency, uh, you can automatically kind of resolve dependency, uh, dependencies quite easily and, and also fast. And this is kind of one of the great kind of introductions to Rust. Like, uh, you know, when you're coming, especially from like C++ or something, and you're adding dependencies and getting functionality and everything just works and is kind of magical. Um, and it also allows, uh, most importantly, for the, the ecosystem as a whole to uh, evolve at uh, differing paces, right? So 
uh, one crate can decide I want to use this bleeding edge version of some crate, and then the rest of the ecosystem is saying, okay, well, actually, that one's kind of risky. Um, maybe I'll uh, wait until it's kind of stabilized or something. Uh, but they can both use that, and you can use all of the crates that use any of the versions, uh, and it's totally fine. Uh, the cons, of course, are not great. Um, so if you have more versions of more crates, uh, then you download more to compile. And then if you compile more, you link more. And if you link more, you have larger outputs. And that's both the actual final binaries that you ship, uh, as well as your local target directories, which can get quite large. And then the fun, uh, you expected type X and got type X. Thanks, Cargo. No rust. Um, so the duplicate handling basically gives you the uh, way to see, look at your crate graph, uh, give a concise kind of inclusion graph for that, and then allow you to kind of manage how you deal with duplicates. Um, so we basically say, OK, we're going to deny multiple versions, and then we're going to skip a few. And then this is kind of what it looks like. So if we had two versions of base64, um, I'll basically give you the inclusion graph for both all, all of the versions. You have more than more than two. The t two is the typical case, and then kind of uh, yeah, highlight where they're coming in. Uh, but it also has a, a different graph output as well, um, optionally. And the idea is that uh, the blue lines show the path to the lowest version, which is typically the one that you want to get rid of. Uh, and then the red path is the path to the one with the fewest number of edges, which is typically going to be the one that's the easiest to remove. Uh, obviously, this is a, a contrived case. Uh, this is kind of much more typically what uh, the graph will look like. Um, I think this is like X Wayland and Winit or something. Uh, but yeah, there's like multiple duplicate versions there that all go to this one. And yeah, it's, it's, it can be a mess. Um, but the idea is that, uh, yeah, it gives you the notice, like, hey, something is here. Uh, and then once you find duplicates, then yeah, we have to decide what we want to do with them. Uh, sometimes you don't care, and that's totally fine. So then you just skip it. Uh, and then often you'll want to maybe open a PR to bump a version that uh, needs bumping or change your version to point to the same version that a dependency is using to just get rid of the duplicate. Uh, there's basically, you know, whatever you want to do. Uh, there's a lot of options. Uh, and, and kind of to reiterate kind of the point, like, uh, we don't think duplicates are bad because, like I said, they ha it does have a lot of positives. It, can, it lets you just do your work without kind of getting in the way. Um, but uh, th the duplicate detection is there so that you can notice it and actually make a decision about how you want to deal with it. Uh, next, we have advisories. Uh, so the advisories is, are, are built on top of uh, RustSec. Uh, so if anyone's used Cargo Audit, uh, this is the same core crate that Cargo Audit uses to uh, mm -hmm. download uh, deserialize and inspect your um, your crates with uh, advisories. Uh, and this is uh, cool because it allows for a kind of centralized knowledge base of uh, advisories for all different kinds of things that uh, people can contribute to and kind of um, yeah help each other with. Uh, and then it's not just for vulnerabilities. Uh, there's also notices for unmaintained crates, so crates that the author is either un completely unresponsive or is explicitly said, like, I, I'm not working on this anymore, or for crates that served a purpose, but for example, maybe now be in uh, the standard library itself or have been supplanted by a superior crate. Um, it also can detect yanked versions. Uh, this isn't really a problem in practice that I've noticed, but it's there if you want it. Uh, as well as, like, obviously the possibility of more kind of advisories in the future. Uh, so yeah, so you can basically say how you want to deal with vulnerabilities, how you want to deal with unmaintained crates, how you want to deal with yank crates, and then the ability to ignore specific advisories that um, maybe you don't care about. Uh, in this case, this the spin is unmaintained, but lazy static uses it, and everything uses lazy static, so it's kind of 
yeah, up to lazy static to remove it at some point. Uh, and this kind of the output it gives you it kind of gives you the information that's stored in the the database for each advisory, um, and that'll give you links to you know alternatives in the case of unmain crates uh, or what versions you should uh, update to to get r rid of the security vulnerability. <laughs> And the last thing that we have is the source check. Um, so Corga has multiple sources uh, that it can use as uh, for crates. So there's the local source from a file path, uh, crates.io, registries, uh, but then most importantly, Git. Uh, so this is the blog post kind of motivated uh, the addition of this check, and it's basically talking about npm lock files, um, but there is some relation to cargo lock files. Uh, so we have a typical kind of PR uh, from my boss, uh, updating dependencies, and as is typical with GitHub, it'll just hide the diff. Looks fine. Uh, but if you look in the lock file, you would see that actually the version changed, but also the source changed, right? So. So instead of going to crates.io, now it's going to get.com, definitely not mining bitcoins. Uh, so yeah, eh. uh, so, so basically the uh, configuration for this is just whether you lo allow or deny um, unknown registries and unknown git sources. And then basically, if you deny unknown git sources or, or registries, you kind of opt into them instead of uh, you know the typical case of just opting to get anything from anywhere. And that's kind of the output of it. Yep, it just says uh, found a source that wasn't explicitly allowed and then points to the, the actual thing. So, so future, um, we probably want to add more checks. Uh, so one example would maybe be unused dependencies. So there is UDEPs, uh, but that does actually hook into Rust-C itself. Uh, we think it could be faster um, to just check for unused dependencies um, just by doing regexes and so forth. Uh, we're also thinking about doing maybe proc macro build RS kind of stuff as well because uh, while proc macros and build RS are great, uh, they're also huge security holes and um, we kind of want to be at least aware when we add a dependency on something that uses a procedural macro or build RS file for example, just so that we can kind of say, um, should we be adding this? And yeah, if anyone else has any ideas of other things that could be added to it, it would be cool. Um, and then also there's this issue for cargo, uh, but the basic idea is that uh, cargo could expose some way to hook into the dependency resolution of cargo itself. Uh, and this would be really cool because instead of, right now cargo deny just looks at the um, Depend the resolved dependencies after cargo is done with it. Uh, if you had this, you could at dependency resolution time stop something from getting into your graph in the first place. Uh, and this would be particularly useful for things like security vulnerabilities. Like, I don't want to add a dependency and then have my CI fail. I just want to not have it in there in the first place. Uh, and we do have a GitHub action uh, that you can use. And here's a few of the users. Most of them are our crates, but there is uh, Tonic, um, the gRPC uh, library. And here's, yeah, links to all the stuff. So the tool itself, uh, SPDX, expression parser and evaluator, creates is like a simple thing that basically takes cargo metadata and marries it to pet graph. Uh, there's config expert, which evaluates con configuration expressions. Uh, and then there's cargo audit and Rustsec, and then cargo about our kind of license attribution tool as well. So yeah, that's it. Yeah, one question. No one. Okay. okay. Do we have any others? What does Cargo about do? Uh, so Cargo about uh, uh, uses the uh, more like it deep scans the every single file uh, in uh, crate source to detect any licenses, and then basically make sure that they match the declared licenses, and if they don't, uh, basically gives a uh, error. 
and then uh, you can configure to say like, okay, actually there's an additional license in this location, but basically just takes them all together, uh, puts all the attributions in for each crate together, and then you can take that information and pass it to a handlebar template, and then the handlebar template can be whatever you want. Uh, we use like a HTML one, and the idea is you know create something like the Firefox uh, at attribution page so that you can list every single crate that's being used, every single license that's used, and then the license text for each of the crates. So 